hello to people on YouTube who may be watching this. We had an unfortunate uh, snafu with our initial attempt to record this meetup. So we are recording this for a uh, select small audience. Uh, to anyone who did attend this meetup and got to witness uh, what just happened, EFF Austin would like to officially apologize for that. We are a community that believes in openness and transparency and we'll be giving people freedom. Um, some people chose to abuse that. We're going to have to um, probably institute additional security uh, administrative policies on our Zoom going forward. So it may be a little less freewheeling than it's been. I um, think it will still allow you to engage in the robust conversations and dialogue that we have always enjoyed. But uh, some people have forced me to institute a few rules and that's just gonna be how it is going forward. But to anybody who had to uh, witness uh, our Zoom bomber, I'm very sorry. Uh, and um, we will be making changes so that that does not happen to you at our meetups going forward. I am sorry for anyone who was upset at what they witnessed. Um, I'm just very sorry. <laughs> so um, what I'm gonna do here um, is I'm gonna have my introductory spiel a little shorter than normal um, because most of you know who we are pretty much. So I'm not going to do the whole who we are. Um, if you are watching this for the first time on YouTube, check one of our other videos for more information about who we are. Um, yeah, events coming up. Um, I will not be running July's meetup as I will be out of town. Our board member David's gonna be running it and he's gonna be giving us a rundown of some of the bills that recently passed the Texas legislator, so the legislature in this last session relevant to digital civil liberties and giving us the good and bad so that we can level set and know where our activism until the next legislative cycle needs to lie. Um, we're also gonna have a uh, presentation from a uh, cybersecurity official. I'm trying to remember his exact name. Um, oh yes, we're gonna have a presentation from uh, Casey O'Brien, who's gonna be, um, there's been a lot of recent cybersecurity news with these big prominent hacks in the news recently. He's gonna be coming and giving us his years of expertise and overview on these incidents. So those are our talks coming up. As I was also saying, um, look forward to these eventually resuming in person in some capacity. As I said, I'm gonna be out of town next month. So we probably won't really seriously start looking at in-person resumption until August or September at the earliest, but stay tuned for that. And um, finally, as I was saying before, uh, we had to restart the meetup in um, December, in addition to our normal holiday party, it may end up being an event trying to celebrate our 30th anniversary. So stay tuned for that. Um, and yes, I guess I will just say uh, welcome Aslan uh, for just joining us. Um, and just to level set you, as I said, yeah, we got, uh, we got Zoom bomb pretty bad. So we're gonna be instituting some new security going forward. So that's what that was all about. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Okay, um, so um, yes, I'm going to now go through my standard uh, introduction of our speakers and we will go from there. Um, so yes, our speakers this month are Danny Collada and Kerry O'Connor. Danny Collada, he's the acting chief innovation officer of the city of Austin. He brings 13 years of experience in innovation, sustainability science, networks, decision-making, planning, and intervention strategy. He specializes in designing strategic frameworks that let groups pursue their goals the smart way and ensure their actions add up to the outcomes they want to see. He has program design and management experience in consulting, academic startup and government settings, as well as team leadership and development for nonprofits. He's been the co-principal investigator of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant to explore the use of blockchain to help people experiencing homelessness keep digital documents safe and accessible. Most recently, he coordinated the founding of the Austin Civilian Conservation Corps. He holds a master's in sustainability from Arizona University and a bachelor of arts in anthropology and business from UT Austin. Um, and then um, our other speaker is Kerry O'Connor. Kerry O'Connor started the City of Austin Innovation Office in March 2014 to help city teams identify and test effective solutions to the complex challenges facing Austin. Under her direction, the Innovation Office helped the city break new ground on topics such as homelessness, displacement man, uh, mitigation, use of emerging technologies such as blockchain to help people experiencing homelessness hold on to their documents, racial profiling analysis, reimagining public safety, 
catalyzing green jobs, and social innovation through challenge grants and incorporating new methodologies of co-creation, design thinking, data science, and experience engagement. She served as the principal investigator on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant to explore the use of blockchain to help people experiencing homelessness keep digital documents safe and accessible. Previously, Carrie worked at the U.S. Department of State, where she established an innovation unit called the Research and Design Center in the Office of the Secretary of State, helped architect sustainable management reforms, coordinated logistics for the Pittsburgh G20 Summit, served as an executive staffer, and improved programs and operations at two U.S. embassies. She's an entrepreneur, diplomat, storyteller, innovation catalyst, logician, connector, mentor, activator, and first advocate for open innovation in government. She holds a Master of Arts in International Affairs from the George Washington University and a Bachelor of Arts in International Affairs from James Madison University. So as you can see, we have two very impressive speakers with us tonight, and I'm really looking forward to what they're going to be sharing with us. Um, and so just to give you the little level set before I turn things over to them, they're going to be talking to us about the Life Files Project. It is a secure document storage platform that allows people to upload, store, and share their documents digitally. It also facilitates digital document notarization. With a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a City of Austin team designed, built, and tested it with people experiencing homelessness to facilitate access to services. This presentation will cover the platform's design principles, private, secure, self-determinant, accessible, and extensible, and the underlying technical architecture that makes them possible. The presentation will close with a status of the minimum viable product and a discussion around next steps. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our speakers. And um, I guess I'm gonna say, especially given uh, our Zoom bombing incident, I'm going to encourage everyone to hold your questions until they're done talking and just put them in the chat and we'll circle back around when they are done. And um, I'm going to turn my camera off here because I have not had dinner yet. Don't wanna subject you to having to watch that, but I will be here um, watching things. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our two speakers. Thank you both so much for bearing with us through technical difficulties. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. And thanks everyone for, for also sticking with us and, uh, and coming back for, for this presentation. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. We've got a number of slides. We'll try to move through them relatively quickly, um, but we're really looking forward to your honest thoughts and feedback, any questions or concerns um, we're, we're in a minimum viable uh, product stage, so we are completely open to, to any critique or feedback that you might have for us. Um, I'm over here to share the screen. Great. So what we're talking about is um, this Life Files application, which is about digital identity document storage. What we're going to go over, um, a quick background on how we got to now, uh, what we're solving for, uh, so that you understand what prompted us to engage in this project. Then we'll briefly demonstrate, um, just through slides, not through an interactive demo, but how Life Files works. It's relatively simple, but the underlying technical architecture is, is not that simple. And so we'll spend most of our time together in section four and then we'll give you a brief update on what our intended next steps are and then, and then open it up for conversation. So we've been at this project for, uh, for a little while. Um, we had received in the innovation office a grant um, from Bloomberg Philanthropies to, to have a, a team that would explore a large topic. We chose homelessness. We interviewed um, 120 people living the experience of homelessness to understand what their day-to-day -day life was like we also did lived experience uh, with case managers, social workers, and the homelessness outreach street team, which is a team combined of police officers, uh, community health paramedics from EMS, mental behavior health counselors from Integral Care, um, as well as the downtown Austin Community Court. So with that feedback from this wide array of people in the community, we identified the need to help people experiencing homelessness hold on to their documents. We explored the use of blockchain because we had heard that a number of uh, international organizations were helping refugees do something very similar to hold on to documents and other things about themselves using uh, blockchain technologies. And we wanted to see if that was analogous. So we had 
a mayor's challenge here in Austin where we invited the Austin Blockchain Collective um, to, to test it out and see if there was anything worth pursuing. We found that there was in fact a use case and we took that evidence of a proof of concept to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We applied for a grant. Um, it was for pioneering uh, technology in, in health. And so we got the grant. We got about $400,000 to form a small team to further explore the concept. And so that team worked over um, the fall of 2019 and most of 2020, uh, bringing us to where we are now, um, where we have the minimum viable product that we'll go through today. So what is it that we're really solving for with this? As uh, Kevin and I were, were chatting at the beginning, it's like, oh, well, we have Google Drive or we have Dropbox. Like, why, why do we want to explore this concept? Um, so the first problem that we're trying to solve is that this is a hidden problem for people living on the streets. Um, when the homelessness outreach street team would engage with people on the street, they would find that um, clients who were seeking services uh, lacked an ID. And there was 13 specific services that they were trying to access. And all of those services were delayed uh, by multiple weeks if they, if they didn't have their ID. When the Other Ones Foundation, um, a local nonprofit working out at Camp Esperanza um, out on 183, they found that 70 to 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of their clients were lacking documents for more than more one services that they were trying to access. We also found that social service providers, um, the downtown Austin Community Court and Trinity Center, uh, we're spending about $20,000 a year uh, just purely in document replacement costs. Um, it costs money to go get a new copy of your birth certificate, for example, and all of those costs add up. Um, and the other one's foundation would spend a cumulative 1,200 hours just helping people procure their documents. So there's quite um, an efficiency drag and a cost here um, that was going on for the service providers. But for the people living on the streets, um, they told us that it would give them more agency and control and less worry. Um, they were really excited to explore this concept because they said a, a small act of a digital ID can save lives. These are some of the quotes um, that, they, that they gave us as we were going through this project. You know, paper documents are hard to keep up with and expensive and time consuming to replace. Having the ability to have documents digitally notarized is an awesome feature. Um, this would be a secure place to keep my documents without fear of them being stolen or having their identity taken. And it's easy access. They don't have to worry about losing uh, the documents or potential employers could see the documents. And this was news to us. There's actually a limit on the number of social security cards you can have in your lifetime. And people living on the streets will, will actually rub up against that, that limit. Um, the limit is 10. Um, and if you need an 11th social security card, uh, you have to go through the courts to get it. So one thing that I'm going to do very briefly, I'm going to turn off my headphones um, and I'm going to play this video so that you can hear in their own words um, what this, uh, this platform means. Um, this is our user experience designer, uh, Pablo, and he's doing some user testing on the platform. Um, and while the, the test was loading, he was engaging in conversation and all participants uh, gave us consent uh, that we could share this video with you today. Have you ever lost an important document? Have you ever had to go through the hustle of trying to reacquire it? Yeah, absolutely, man. I've lost uh, birth certificates, uh, social security cards, um, IDs. Last year, I lost my ID like uh, three times. And it's just weird how stuff comes up missing sometimes. Like maybe someone would take it or, you know, just try to, you know, steal your identity or something. And I had my identity stolen. I don't know how many times people, really? I, even when I was working, um, the people reached behind my uh, desk because I was uh, working at a hotel. They reached behind the desk and stole my purse. Yes. And it's a hassle. <laughs> yeah, no, I, of course it is. Um, tell me about it. What, what was it like? What document was it? And Well, I mean, at one time, um, it was when I was really bad into my addiction with drinking. I mean, I just lost everything. So I had to get driver's license, birth certificate, you know, everything. And that is quite the hassle. But you can't do anything in this world without those documents. 
you know, I'm going through that little issue right now with getting them, like, getting a copy of them, you know, a place. Yeah, and what, what has that experience been like, like trying to get it back? It's been, you know, the process has been like very slow because, you know, then because of the pandemic, it's made it extremely hard. Did, did you have to like reacquire some of those documents that you probably lost? Like your social yeah, security and, like, card? Yeah, and my parents are deceased and my brother and sister don't live in the state of Texas. And so can you only imagine, well, now I know what to do. You know, I can go and get my uh, transcript from high school, but think about it. I got to go to Round Rock to do that. And then all of COVID's going on. <laughs> so it, especially now. All right. So I'm. Can't hear you. No, we, we can't hear you right now. You can't hear me now? Okay. Oh, now I can I'm gonna hear move. you. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, it's a five minute video, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but you kind of get the gist of, um, of what a hassle it is when you don't have your driver's license or your birth certificate or some of your other core documents. So let's look at what some of the social service providers have said as we've been doing uh, user testing with them. Um, first, the Sunrise Homeless Navigation Center, they're down um, uh, sort of off of uh, Manchac and they are the only full service navigation center that stayed open during the pandemic. And you can see here that they say without the documents, they can't get jobs, apply for housing, cash checks, open bank accounts, they, can't, they cannot get on their feet. And so, as we look at the camping ban, a practical effect of that will be sweeps will result in property being lost, stolen, or destroyed. And that's what was, was happening when we first started looking at this project, was people were losing their documents if a cleanup came through, um, which is one of the reasons we think that this, this project is really important. Austin Public Health um, has recognized that document and identity management are immense hurdles for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, and it's really easy for a lot of us to take that for granted. Um, but this idea of making identity management, document storage, resilient, secure, and intuitive for the end user is something that they are also interested in seeing. Foundation Community serves a lot of low-income clients, and they say that this would be really beneficial. Um, a lot of clients cancel appointments because they can't find their documentation. And having access uh, through a shared research resource, sorry, amongst partner organizations would be beneficial. So people may see foundation communities, but then they may go to Austin Public Health and they may go to Sunrise. They, they stop off at a lot of different service providers that are not always in what's known as the continuum of care. Um, integral care. Um, Live files will make it possible for individuals not to miss out on opportunities. Um, those delays in getting the documents uh, are really a hurdle. Downtown Austin Community Court, uh, as we've heard before, live files would save time and resources. Austin Travis County EMS, um, they say this would allow them to continue to work on a client's navigational path rather than starting over every time they, she comes across someone that's, that's new to her. Um, and the Texas Homelessness Network, um, they said Life Files would be solving a problem that they've been trying to solve for a really long time. So Life Files is an improvement upon current practices because you get easier transferability across systems. Um, you'll hopefully see what we mean by that when we talk about how to share uh, documents. If there's lower effort over the long run, after the initial document procurement, the number of repeat efforts should lessen. Um, and increasingly, it will help clients do more things on their own and reducing barriers to services. There have been mutual aid groups who have expressed interest in holding document clinics um, to help get community members in need organized and prepared to apply for assistance. Um, this would enable them uh, to be able to do that in a secure manner. So that's kind of what we're solving for, both in terms of a problem statement as well as opportunities. So let's take a look at how the platform works. Um, as mentioned in the, in the abstract about this presentation, there are five design principles that we established from the get-go, and we made sure that everything we were doing um, helped us 
implement these principles. We wanted it to be secure. We wanted it to be private, meaning we want the individual to have the ability to share, revoke, or delete access to key identity documents. Um, we wanted it to be self-determinant. Oftentimes, people who are engaging in these services, um, you know, there's a there's a power imbalance there um, that we would like to help give that sense of autonomy, autonomy and self-determination back to folks. We want it to be accessible because we understand that there are a lot of people who are not as digitally included. Um, and so how can we design an accessible platform giving the conditions that people are facing? And we wanted it to be extensible, both in terms of the technology being adaptable, as well as uh, a variety of use cases. Um, Daniel, do you want to take it over from here? Yeah, absolutely. So th this is getting a little more into the nuts and bolts of, of how this works. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of start broad and go down from there. But I, I think those, those design principles that Kara just mentioned are, are really important because they really tie back to, if you remember that, that pathway we took to get here, um, you know, we started from this human centered design approach and it really arrived at those principles um, from there, not, we didn't, you know, build the product and then, and then try to figure out how to put this in. These were the core and we, we hadn't, we hadn't designed a thing uh, before, before we had set out those, uh, those core principles. So as we start to uh, talk about how this actually works in practice, there's two, there's just two types of, of users um, on black files. There are document owners. Uh, those are the, you can think of them as the main account holders. These are the people that have their documents on life files. Uh, and it's really important to uh, remember that they have full autonomy over how their files are stored, who they're stored with, and who they're shared with. Um, the second type of uh, uh, user is document helpers. And you can think of these as people who may serve or aid document owners. Uh, they may be social workers, volunteers, third party notaries, um, and they're here to assist, uh, assist the owners. Again, the, don the owners have full control over what happens. Um, and they also have uh, full control over the documents themselves. Uh, their documents never leave their device and their account. Go next slide. So these are just the very basic functions that uh, an owner uh, can uh, undertake in my files. So you can upload documents into your account. You can obviously then store them uh, and browse and access them, and work with them. Go okay, next slide. You can download those documents back uh, to, to whatever device you would like or whatever location you'd like. Uh, if you want to, to take the copy off live files or take it off live files, you can share with helpers. Um, and, and we'll go into the, some details around that in just a moment. You can go, you can carry. Uh, these are two important uh, parts that we'll also talk about more later. You can notarize, obviously you have to be a digital notary to be able to notarize documents, but you can notarize documents on live files and you can also verify the notarized documents are indeed oh, valid and accurate. Good, next slide. So Life Files is uh, available from any device that can, that can browse the web. So you uh, can get on a phone, uh, tablet, or, or computer. Uh, that means that people can get on at the library, they can get on from their phone. They I'm listening can, to this uh, also presentation. Access it at a point of service as well from a service provider's device or computer. Go to the next slide, Carrie. <clears throat> the administrative setup is uh, also something that we wanted to mention. So. Service providers, you know, helpers. There are um, admin accounts, and we've made these extremely, I guess I would call it flexible or adaptive. Um, when setting up an admin account, we can set permissions to to do or not do basically anything that's available within 
supply files um, so that we can we can be flexible as we partner in the future or as there's different use cases that come up with this in the future. We made it really easy to install live files. Uh, you basically need one IT person. You do not need a dev team. Um, so there's a big variety of uh, organizations that could uh, host an instance of this or take advantage of this. That I mean, it, as I um, just mentioned, the administrative setup is very flexible. Um, as well, the onboarding of helpers from the administration side is very simple um, and flexible and straightforward. And there are roles that can be assigned to those helpers, which can carry different permissions. Um, so we've tried to make that as flexible as possible. The next slide. So Carrie, I think you're going to jump in here on the underlying tech core architecture. I'll hand it back to you. OK. So um, let's talk about two particular design principles and how the technical architecture supports them. So how, do was, how is it that we're keeping the documents secure? And how is it that we're making the platform accessible? So as we were setting out to solve for this challenge, the first challenge was security and sharing. So how do we make sure that files are completely secure and still allow the sharing of documents with anyone the user chooses? The first thing is that the original files, because these are all people's personal identity documents, um, that they are encrypted in the browser before they are uploaded to the database. And we are using a decentralized public key infrastructure. So the encryption happens with a public key um, and it is signed with a private key. And all of this is encrypted in the browser. Um, and we can go over uh, some more details about that. Um, and then there's a, um, uh, when it is shared, um, this is when you can see that you have the exchange of the, um, the public and the private keys. Um, one thing of, of note is that when you're downloading it from the server and you're decrypting it with the owner's private key, um, the, the, the save file is saved to the MyPass with the key. But if that person deletes the file, they still maintain their original file, this is the blue file, but the one that they've shared uh, goes away. So if they want to remove the document from having been shared, that is, that is how that um, can happen. So the second challenge is key stewardship, right? Because if we're using public key infrastructure um, in a decentralized fashion, how do folks log into the app if they have a hard time remembering passwords? So the first thing to know about key stewardship is that we have a standalone OAuth server. Um, we wanted to make it accessible, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we wanted to make it secure by design, not secure by benevolence. So the administrator of the OAuth server would be different than the administration of the server itself. Um, you would have two different parties and the person running the platform is, is not able to access the, the passwords of the, of the folks who are running the platform. Now, if you are living on the streets, um, you know, a lot of the things that we all take for granted in logging onto a platform, what you have, a phone often gets lost, what you know, a password, you know, you're living on the streets, you, you have a lot of trauma, um, maybe, mental capacities are diminished um, and maybe there's some addiction to play. So remembering the passwords can be a challenge. Um, so we looked at other ways to develop multiple ways of logging in, including social support and an option to have biometrics. So we give people the option to choose their method of login, security questions, maybe a palm biometric, a password, a text login or a social support. But then we said, you know, if you're asking people who are living on the streets to make the decision about which login method is best for them, that might be a bit of a challenge. So what we did to break this trade off between security and accessibility is that we give folks a short quiz. Um, do you want help in selecting your login methods? So how often do you forget your passwords and have to reset them often or rarely? How comfortable are you using your camera to scan your palm? Um, how comfortable are you with biometrics? 
Um, how good are you at answering security questions? How often do you forget your passwords? Those kinds of things. And at the end um, of how they answered, uh, based on those answers, a recommendation is made on what the best uh, login methods would be for those individuals. And so now I'm gonna turn it back over to Daniel, who's gonna talk about how the platform's technical architecture makes it private and self-determinant. Yeah, so these are, these are just as uh, important as the rest of our design principles. Um, so privacy, obviously being that, uh, you know, agency is, is a good word here, that the, the owner retains the agency and full control over their documents. Um, and also is able to, to take those documents um, and kind of do what they uh, need to do with them uh, instead of basically the, you know, everyone else in the system having a copy of their vital documents except them. Um, so we'll run through some of the specifics of that now. Carrie, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the administration of privacy, you know, our question here was how do the administration, administrative settings maximize privacy and autonomy? Because that's, that's usually kind of the opposite of what they do. So we want to turn that on its head. We started with the permissions hierarchy. So if you, if you see the people in the top bubbles along the bottom, I kind of read this slide from, from um, right to left. So uh, the key here is that the permissions take place in the, the following order. Admins grant uh, a user type um, access to a feature, and then an owner has to give permissions to a helper to actually do something. So the example is if a helper who's on the far right says, can I download your birth certificate, owner? Two things have to be true. Number one, the administrator, administrator has to have authorized the helper to be able to download documents in the first place. And then most importantly, the helper who was asked whether they can have the birth certificate also has to grant, uh, I'm sorry, the owner who was asked also has to grant the helper permission to download their birth certificate. So there's two levels of security there um, to, to make sure that owners really have full control uh, and helpers who usually have the most control in the system um, are not able to take advantage of it in any way. Can go to the next slide. So owners have to, so owners are the people that own the documents. They have to first add a helper um, and set permissions for them to be able to do anything. So if an owner goes into Sunrise Church and wants help filling out uh, a disability application, for instance, they have to grant someone at Southern Rise Church who's already registered as a helper, um, they have to make that connection with them. Um, and they can do make two choices at the beginning. They can say whether they would want that helper to be able to help them recover access to their account. Uh, so as Carrie talked about, social attestation uh, is one of the login methods that's available uh, on live files. And you can also select whether that helper should be able to upload documents on your behalf or not. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Carrie. So there are, there's another uh, layer beyond just saying someone can upload documents. Um, so once the helper is connected, they can request um, access to owner documents and owners then have the ability and agency to give them the following permissions. They can say someone can view a document, they can say someone can download a document, and they can say someone can replace a document. Uh, and they can, they can toggle all of those independently. Um, so, so that's the second layer uh, of, of kind of autonomy that owners have in this. And you can go ahead and next slide, Kerry. If an owner, allows a helper to view but not download a document, the file is covered with a big watermark, um, which in our case legally invalidates it as a digital copy um, to be legally enforceable uh, in, in any uh, process that it's used in. So our next challenge um, 
giving autonomy of transactions with digital documents. So how do we expect people to use images of documents as if they're originals? I'm gonna um, you know, talk a bit, um, hopefully not too in depth here, but it's really important to remember that you know, we're very used to having paper copies or physical copies of documents that are pretty easily verifiable as, as originals in most cases. There are, there are lots of security features on driver's licenses, on birth certificates, et cetera, that, that make them distinguishable as an original. That's not the case for digital documents, um, both in their format and often how they are uploaded and presented in these types of platforms. You know, people snap a picture with their phone. It is, it is nearly impossible um, and certainly not legally enforceable to say a picture of a birth certificate um, on a phone is, is uh, the actual valid birth certificate. This is a problem because many of the services that our uh, owners, our clients on here have to access with these documents do have legal requirements behind them. Um, so to the, there are five legal requirements for document to be digitally notarized, which in this case, notarization is the most robust way we found um, to, to certify a document is actually an original and valid. We'll talk about that more soon. Um, so the five uh, requirements are that a digital signature is used, the, the signer of that digital signature is a notary, that the document itself is tamper resistant, uh, that the notarized document is controlled by its owner uh, and that the notarized document is an original and not a copy. And again, this is all, these are all required at the time of notarization. You can go to the next slide, Carrie. So, you know, you might think about verifiable credentials. Um, I probably don't have to explain this to you all, but you know, the, a very, very basic um, explanation of, is a, of a verifiable credential is an issuer that has some type of authority uh, or reputation issues a, we'll call it a document to uh, the document holder. Uh, and then that document also, you know, the, the information about it goes into an official registry. The document holder is then able to present that document to someone who verifies it. Um, and they verify it based on the reputation or the authority of the issuer. A good analogy for this is um, getting into a bar, right? You go to the door of the bar, there's a bouncer, you have to show them your ID. They look at that ID, uh, or and in many cases they scan it, and that ID says valid. That ID is not valid because you gave it to them. That ID is valid because the state of Texas has created a law and therefore has the authority to say that this type of document, if presented in its original form, functions as a verification of this person's age. Our issue is when you take a picture of that, um, if you have a fuzzy picture of that ID on your phone, it loses that uh, the ability to be a legally executable document. This, the state has not conferred that power um, or that, that um, validity onto a picture on your phone. It conferred it to the actual ID itself. Um, so we couldn't use verifiable credentials uh, attached to a picture per se. But um, what we figured out we could do, and go to the next slide, Gary, is that notarization actually can function as uh, a version of a verifiable credentialing concept, especially um, the, the concept of e-notarization, which is digital notarization. It's called e-notarization because the statutes for this were written in the 90s when we put e in front of everything <laughs> that happened on the internet. Um, but, but nevertheless, uh, it's the same use case. So when a digital notary verifies that a document is an original, it has the same legal standing as a physical original document. In fact, there's a statute in Texas that says basically, quote, if a digital notarization is valid, no one can reject it on the basis of its digital form. So that means that digitally notarized 
identity documents have to be accepted um, if they were correctly and uh, validly notarized in the first place. So this was kind of a big breakthrough for us because um, we th this is what made it to where we weren't just another version of Dropbox, right? Because because anyone can get Dropbox or Google Google Drive or whatever and put uh, you know pictures and, and copies of whatever they want to on there and present it to whoever they want to. Uh, but this really allowed us to say, okay, these are these are legally transactable documents to the level that a lot of our our um, owners need to actually access these services. So this is when we we knew we were onto a little something here. So you can go to the next slide, Carrie. So we had this knowledge. Uh, we had to do something with it because there's definitely no tools uh, that are easily integrated. Um, for for digital notarization, so we we basically had to build a digital notarization platform. Um, in Life Files now, uh, you know, certified digital notaries can log on to an app uh, and be certified as a helper, uh, and then they can make certified digital copies of phys physical documents that they witness on an owner's behalf. Um, we created a digital template, a verifiable credential schema, uh, and and what that means is the act of notarization creates the digitally signed uh, notarized document as well as a record of that notarization is stored in a verifiable credential on a public ledger. So if anyone was wondering where we're gonna get to the blockchain part, this is it. Um, we had investigated applications of blockchain from a wide variety uh, of angles, um, you know, from storing documents uh, to doing all types of, of uh, potential smart contracts um, to everything in between. And it, it really wasn't a good fit uh, for, for any of those use cases. There were things that were easier and more effective. However, what this does uh, is it helps meet that legal standard because it said, you know, at a point in time, this uh, notarization happened uh, at, on an immutable ledger uh, so that it can be go, go back and verified um, that uh, it was an original and not a copy because the notarizer saw it uh, and that the owner had control over their document at that time because the notarizer witnessed it. Uh, so having that immutable record of that tied to the notarization helps us meet uh, all of the points of the statutes for digital documents. Go to the next slide. So as far as uh, going just a, a little bit more into um, the, the details of the, the public ledger applications, um, you, we've put in three options for storing the notarization metadata. Uh, they can go on Ethereum, they can go on RootStack. Uh, there's also a free option available uh, in a public S S3 bucket on AWS. Uh, we made these options just to give us some flexibility in the future. Um, Ethereum, obviously very stable, but also the most expensive option. Um, Rootstock is cheaper. Uh, it's, it's obviously a branch on Bitcoin, um, so, so slightly less known. And then there's the free, uh, more centralized option on AWS. You go to the next slide, Carrie. During the notarization process, a notary, the notary is able to select which, uh, which option they want to choose. Um, Again, uh, and, and the platform, the LifeOS platform pays for the cost here uh, to, to transmit that information and, and record it. We'll probably do some, some additional work here to, to give some better uh, guidance or defaults or something on which a, a notary would choose. Uh, we don't expect many digital notaries to, to have a real good idea of, of which option they would uh, necessarily um, want to choose here, but we did build it in. Um, and, I th and I think that gives us some powerful flexibility for the future. Good. Next slide, Carrie. So, uh, um, our another challenge that stemmed from us figuring out the notarization is how, how do we help people interact with digital notarizations? I mean, what we mean by that is how do people know it's real? You know, if um, think if I email, you know, I emailed you a PDF uh, and and told you it was a digital digital notarization. Like what, what would you do with that? How, how would you react with that? Would you, you know, how would you know that was real? Um, so, so this is what we're going into now, so especially in these services that have these, this um, you know, legal barrier uh, to meet. 
So to handle that, we uh, actually, I, I keep saying we, our awesome team um, created a standalone uh, digital notarization verification site. There are private instances uh, of this that you have to pay for, and this is not one of them. Um, so anyone can upload a notarized document to the site and check if it's valid. Uh, this was, uh, uh, it's it was a tricky thing to do because we wanted to, we, we basically had to show people that it was real and it was right. If this site was hosted by the state of Texas, for instance, you would probably trust it, uh, but it's not, it's hosted by us. So how do you know that what we're telling you, you know, the digital notarized document is indeed valid, especially when you're making decisions that have legal consequences um, to them. You know, how, how do you trust this? Number one, I'll say we did actually review this with the state of Texas and they verified that it, that it was, it was very good um, and totally valid. But what we did for everyone else is we're really relying on uh, just radical transparency um, at this point. So you can go to the next slide, Carrie. So as you as you uh, upload uh, a, a a document to check and see if the notarization is valid, uh, two things happen at every step. Number one, uh, there is an expandable section that allows you to see a step by step breakdown of what the what the program is doing, uh, the real data that we that we passed back and forth um, with uh, with the other systems to make that validation as well as third-party web tools um, that you can also use to validate our work. So all of the technical data is there. Um, everything that happens is shown. Um, and then you can go to the next slide, Carrie. That may not mean a lot to many people. So we also um, created a parallel tab uh, that you can click to get a plain language description uh, of exactly what's happening under the hood and what each step means. So the idea is that you can toggle between the plain language version saying, you know, this is happening here, then that's happening there. And then you could go over to the technical steps and actually see the data that's being passed um, to where, from whom, um, and, and some auditable processes behind it uh, that actually inform those descriptions. Um, and uh, then you're able to have confidence that this site actually does accurately tell you whether a digital notarization is valid or not. I'm going to turn it back over to you here, Carrie, to talk through our next steps. Great. So we mentioned that we were in a minimum viable product stage, and we've been doing some work to validate our steps along the way. So can a document owner accomplish something with this platform? And we think about that in terms of threes. Number one, at a bare, bare minimum, we make it easier to replace documents if they are lost or stolen. Many of us, when we travel overseas and we have our passport, we carry around a plain old photocopy of it because it makes it easier to replace um, when you've got that, that unique number of that document and it's got your picture on it. Some services uh, will accept documents off of the platform um, just by looking at it um, or, or viewing it, downloading it. Um, but it, this is not yet a legal government standard. I wouldn't want to say that if you uh, have life files on your phone and you get pulled over for speeding and you show them your phone and this, you know, copy of your driver's license, I, I wouldn't suggest we go that far. Um, or, or maybe go in, into a court of law just yet. Um, I think more work has to be done there. But for people who are living on the streets, um, who are, and, and the people who are, are helping them, uh, this platform has usefulness for them. But the document owners, how do we know? They will use and rely on the platform. Um, and as we did a lot of user testing, and we sent out a survey, 48 out of 50 people experiencing homelessness agreed that there's a benefit to having a digital and legally valid copy of, our, of their IDs. What about acceptance? How do we know that helpers and document receivers will accept the platform? You may remember uh, the quotes at the beginning where there was eight city and community organizations who have affirmed the need for the solution and expressed willingness to use the platform to help their clients. 
Um, I'm going to skip down to the other green check mark. We do know that this platform will make a difference uh, to people experiencing homelessness because they have told us so. Um, now that leaves us with what's what's left. What does it take to administer the platform? Most social workers are not sitting around wondering if they could administer yet another technology platform. Um, so we wanted to make that something uh, easy and we wanted to make the costs known. Um, and it, that includes just time on task. So we're doing something called a learning launch to kind of work through um, not using real data, but working through the process to see what does it take to administer the platform so that we can offer that advice to any organization who'd want to do so. And then reliability, is the platform stable and can someone fix it if it breaks? Um, we're testing some of the stability now. Um, we're also, we've done a bug bash uh, where we've tried to uncover bugs and now we're doing through the learning launch to, to take another look at the stability. But we also have a contract with a developer to, to maintain the demonstration installation and advise on needed features. And so governance is really kind of our next step, like who decides how changes are made to the platform, um, any funding that might be needed for further development, um, th those kinds of things are still in the works. The learning launch, as I mentioned, is a learning experiment conducted quickly and inexpensively to gather contextual data to determine the merit of committing further time, people, and resources. Um, this is a picture of testing the platform um, out at Camp Esperanza, um, where we're using folks who are on the ground doing the work day to day to see uh, what it would actually take to, to administer the platform, and they're giving us feedback on that. We have identified that there is a need for, for a future roadmap. Um, this is not a completely exhausted list of features or functions. But for administration, you know, we've identified that it would be helpful if there was a sub admin. So those eight uh, community and governmental organizations, for example, they could all have their own helpers, their own case managers, social workers, um, and they would be able to um, sign them up. So if you were Sunrise Community Church, you would be you would become a sub administrator um, just to help your your helpers get on the platform. The use case of having a mutual aid network or, or some other you know, community organization uh, doing a volunteer document clinic, we would wanna have a volunteer helper with a time limitation. That's not a feature that currently exists. And there are no analytics currently installed on the platform. You know, We would want to try to see what we could do in order to just help the platform, but, but maintain people's privacy. We don't, we're not building this because we wanna track people, we're building this because we want them to hold onto their documents when they need them. Um, and from an administrative perspective, um, you know, if we pursued NIST certification and proof of personhood with the multimodal login, this could eventually become the kind of digital identity platform that is what most people think this platform is, which is that one magic unique identifier that helps you log on to everything. Um, that's not what this platform is currently. It's solving a hidden problem that is not available to most people who are not living on the streets, uh, but we could grow to be that if that's something we wanted to do. There's some error handling and validation, uh, things that need to be done. Um, the case managers who we talked to said, hey, it would be really helpful if you just had a, a quick text field that says, by the way, don't forget that the downtown Austin Community Court has agreed to store your, your paper copy of your birth certificate. Um, you know, that would be something that that they would find useful because people sometimes forget where the actual paper copy is. Um, we do need to take that lookup feature that that Daniel mentioned at the end as a verification tool. We want to put it on the front end. We don't want to we don't want to have any fraudulent notaries sign up and come down to the end and find out that you weren't actually a notary. So we need to we need to pull that that into the front end. Um, again, with the storage, there's just some micro instructions and some decision support tools. Um, the sharing functions right now, you really have to be a helper on the platform. Otherwise, it's a, it's a download um, kind of thing, but there could be some enhanced share mechanism. Um, An API, there's a lot of housing uh, application software out there now that, that if you're applying for a, um, an apartment, um, you know, we could have an API so that it could pull that data and check it. 
um, maybe some OCR, you know, optical character recognition so that the, the data, it could become data and help you apply for applications. That could be a future kind of scenario. Um, and then, you know, we do have to adapt to the Secretary of State's website where they're keeping the, the notarization information that helps our verification tool. Um, so that would be something that would have to be maintained. So I'm going to pause here um, to see if you all have any questions or critiques or suggestions or anything that you would like us to go over um, more in depth. Well, first, I just want to say bravo, both of you. We got through the presentation, and I'm so happy that we'll be able to put it on our YouTube channel and hopefully uh, get the message to those who were not able to uh, attend because of our unfortunate technical, technical difficulties. So thank you so much for bearing with me, and thank you both for talking because I, I, I really wanted you to get this word out to as many people as you could. Um, I'm going to be, for our few participants here, I know all of you and know you're real, but this is partially for the YouTube audience, but also just to start modeling what I'm unfortunately going to have to start making behavior going forward. This will not be in the permissions yet. I'm gonna to have to edit those once we're done here, but we're gonna to have to institute a policy where basically permissions are locked down for guests by default, the only, thing I could do as an alternative would be to force people to actually have Zoom accounts and they'd have to log in using those, but that's an accessibility concern and potentially for certain people a privacy concern limiting their accessibility. So I don't want to do that solution. I want people to freely access the link. So what I will have to do is I'm going to basically have to make it where people who are not me or the admins or the speakers, I'm gonna to have to lock down their screen sharing ability their chat ability and their mic ability. And we're going to try to institute a policy if you have a question, do the little raise hand icon, and then I will unmute you. And then hopefully, uh, if you are a bad actor, I'll know exactly who you are and booty you will be much easier. Um, so I'm going to ask if anybody has questions. Um, I mean, you know, if you don't know how, I assume we all know how to use the hand icon at this point. So if you have a question, I'm gonna encourage you to use it. That being said, because I know all of you, feel free to type in the chat if you don't know how to do that. Uh, Carl. <laughs> and normally I'd have to unmute you, but um, you should have permissions to still do it. Oh, wait, I did mute you earlier. That's right. Oh, okay, okay. you were able to do it. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, you see, this is why this is why I resisted putting too many permissions on because already Zoom was weird and I didn't want to make it a hassle for people who were being kind enough to come. But evidently, we're just you know this why we can't have nice things. <laughs> so go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I was wondering if you had checked out what other uh, cities are doing. I can only imagine places like California and New York have already thought of something like this. Yeah, I, I can pull up that comparative landscape slide, Daniel, if yeah. you think that would be. And while you're doing that, I'll say that uh, I would say that most, a lot of people have thought about this. Um, a lot of people are very interested in creating, again, the, the sort of one digital identity solution um, or, or a digital identification card. Uh, and, and other people are taking arguably quicker routes to document storage. Uh, but I, I would say that a lot of those don't address some of these hard problems of, for instance, multimodal login um, to, to really ensure that accessibility is, is as um, easy as possible for people in different types of situations. Don't address things like the legal enforceability of documents, which uh, could really hamper service provision in a lot of cases. So while there are uh, some instances out there uh, that are that you know do similar things, and, and Carrie, I'll let you go through uh, this matrix in just a moment. Uh, the I think we we go deeper in some of these places that uh, take on some of those more human-centered problems that we had, or human-centered challenges that we identified in our early research. Hmm. Yeah. So this is a. Um, uh, a comparative landscape, um, and a lot of this, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, we've been working on this for for quite some time uh, as a very scrappy team. Um, so some of this has been emergent over over the years. 
My Digital Locker um, is brought to you by Amazon Web Services, the Rockefeller Foundation, New America Foundation, and the City of Baltimore. Um, it's more directly tied to the continuum of care. And if you don't know what the continuum of care is, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development encourages every community to have a backbone organization um, of all of their uh, homelessness service providers um, that usually is a network like it is in Austin. Um, and they all work off of one homelessness management information system uh, in order to maintain records about their clients. And so what they've done with my digital locker is they've really kind of worked it for that use case on Amazon Web Services specifically for that continuum of care. What we've tried to do um, is say, well, what if the service provider isn't in the continuum of care, right? What if I want to go get a storage locker on my own? Or what if I want to open up a bank account because some of our folks living on the streets are, are unbanked? Um, then this gives them the ability to go outside of that continuum of care um, if they choose to do so or they, they grow in that capability and, and, and want to do so. It also opens up the door for mutual aid groups because we do know um, in Austin, there's a lot of people who are helping those living on the streets, not just the continuum of care. Um, we also think about foster children um, whose foster parents may collect documents along their journey. Um, this gives them a place to put those documents for that, for that individual. Um, Low-income individuals, um, we've had experiences in the city with um, you know, the, the rental assistance during times of COVID. Uh, a lot of people didn't apply because they still hadn't gotten their documents together. So there's a lot of extensible use cases outside of the continuum of care. Um, and then you have full-time RVers and nomads um, who may also find this really useful because you don't want to necessarily carry your, your, um, your core digital document, your core documents about your personhood, um, you know, around. ID me uh, is um, digital credentials and access management. So this group got started with the military. Let's say you go to a place and you get a military discount, um, but you, who, how do you prove uh, for the purposes of getting that discount, particularly if you're checking out online, that you are in fact military. And that's how they, they started and then they branched out. You could prove that you were a student and get that student discount. You could prove that you were an alumni or a teacher, a nurse, first responder, um, and so on. And they really do digital credentials and access management. Sinex is a digital signatures and notarization, but they're really focused on you know, real estate, um, wealth management. So definitely not solving for people living on the streets. Um, and when you get your digital signature and notarization with Sinex, you don't have a place to store your documents um, for, for future purposes. And Notarize um, is a digital notarization platform, again, focused on lenders and auto retailers and you know, title agents. Um, this is a really strong platform. It was built for notaries, basically. Um, and over the time of us working on this platform, we saw Notarize add uh, document storage but it is a, a, private, um, a private option. What we've tried to do is kind of string together some of these things and really add in an accessible multimodal login. Because if you're living on the streets, it's, it's just not easy for you to, to log into Dropbox or to log into you know, things that we all take for granted. And so we wanted to make it easy, whether or not you've lost your phone or you have any cognitive disabilities for you to still maintain access to these core documents. Yeah, and, and the, the other thing I add about to that too is the, I think the security by design of, of this platform is, um, is another, one of its strongest features, uh, you know, encrypting everything in the browser or on the device, uh, separating the OAuth and application servers uh, basically, there's no backdoor. There's there is no uh, need for a benevolent administrator, although I hope they all are. Uh, you know that that could, you know, if they chose access um, someone's information uh, or or credentials or keys, uh, there there's just no way to do that. So we did try and put full full privacy and autonomy of the user at the forefront and. I think that is not as strong of, or, or not at all a consideration of some of the other problems.
Yeah, I really like this uh, idea because I'm, I'm a veteran and so I know about uh, IDME. So it's a great, you know, just going on my phone and have access to all my medical records and wherever I go and I don't have to carry around this old 20 year old discharge paper. So it's, mm -hmm. um, I, I wish that would expand to other, you know, documents or all documents. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, great. for sure. Oh, yeah, I forgot to make myself. Uh, I'm still out of it. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Carl. Um, yeah, we may not have as many questions as normal because we are smaller attendees than normal. But uh, yeah, Aslan, you got a question? Yeah, so um, I guess I'm kind of curious about like uh, how this would like, how do y'all see if other, like y'all do y'all consider this a project that you would like to see continued elsewhere or like expanding to other parts of government? Like, I guess, I guess my question is like, if y'all were interested in like having seen this expand, like what would it look like from the perspective of like, is it state, local, federal, like, and what are the challenges that might be like related to that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we would love to see this launch. So let's start with the smallest common denominator um we could launch this in austin um with the you know core group of eight service providers now for people living on the streets now um and in a bare minimum help them hold on to their documents so they don't lose them and if they do lose them they can replace them um in order to do that we we have some some small bugs and, and features that really need to be be fixed before we would be comfortable launching it for them um the next piece is the state of texas because the notarization is for the state of texas so we would like then if we can make it work here in austin um it could go statewide um, particularly with the texas homelessness network they are the kind of backbone organization that supports a lot of counties in texas that are working to serve their unhoused population um another state to take this on it's all open source everything is online you can start working it now if you really wanted to but they would have to rewrite the script for the notarization and they would have to make it compliant with their state's notarization laws if we wanted to go federal we would have to pursue that that nist certification um in in order to to have that be be something go to go federal we did have a group called the National Innovation Service. They were working to redesign governance around the homelessness system in Seattle and King County. And they said as part of what needs to happen with redesigning governance in the homelessness system is that they do need a, a digital identity service like this, as well as the ability for, for, for people to, to access digital services um, writ large. So we know that there is interest, and as we mentioned, Baltimore is, is looking at a document storage solution as well. So we think that there's, um, there's the potential to, to scale it, um, and there's the potential to, to start minimizing, you know, a lot of these bumps in the road that people are experiencing right now. And if you've ever followed, you know, the, the stories of people who are living on the streets, um, Chris Baker, who's the CEO of the Other Ones Foundation, he talks about going from barefoot to backpack. You know, if you've been living on the streets for quite some time, you have lost all of those documents and they start working with you. They're a workforce first group. They said, hey, just come on and hang with us and we'll go get day labor. You don't have to have any commitment beyond today. Just you'll get a living wage for today. No commitment. And people will be like, man, I can't because I got a parole hearing tomorrow. And he'll be like, cool, we'll, we'll work that for you. We'll get your bus ticket. We'll figure out where to go. Like, we'll take you there tomorrow. But today you get to work. So they just make it super low barrier, bring people in, help them get some, get some work. And when they come back and they come back and they come back, eventually they start procuring the documents. They start hustling everything that they might need to get back on their feet. And then next thing you know, you know, after some time, they, they've got a new wardrobe, they, they've got tennis shoes, they've got a backpack, they've got all their documents in it. They've basically climbed Mount Everest, like mentally, um, getting back into the system. And then they're on the bus, and then they lose that backpack. 
with all of these documents in it. And that mentally is really tough for people who have been through what they've been through. So it's not just, this is why they say an act of a digital ID can save lives. Because if you've been hitting up against the system, hitting up against the system, hitting up against the system, and you're just like, the system's fucking with me. I'm done with it. Like we've heard this, right? So if any time they hit a hiccup, they just know that this is the system not wanting them, not trying to serve them. So we can lower some of those hiccups right here, right now in Austin. That's the first and foremost goal, um, particularly if um, encampment cleanups are gonna start happening again. Um, because every time somebody loses this, it kicks them back. Amber Price, who was the paramedic um, in our quote, I remember her telling me the story of a, a young kid who just gotten out of foster care um, and he didn't have his social security card, but he was really excited that he got a job. But next time she saw him, he was living on the streets. He's like, it's cool, I got a job. She saw him again, she was like, oh, I need a social security card. I don't, I don't have one of those. It took some like, multiple weeks to get a social security card. And the next time she saw him, his like mental health was already decompensating. Um, so we need to make it so that these folks don't have these issues. This shouldn't be an issue, right? It shouldn't be an issue, but it is. So we wanna start small, start here in Austin, work with what we can work with, build up that proof of concept and keep growing the platform so that it could go statewide and it could go federal. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll also add to that, that uh, while we develop this as an innovation pro project uh, within the city, this, this, uh, this won't be and, and probably shouldn't be hosted by governments necessarily. I think governments can be uh, clients and have those, those sub-admin roles, um, but, but the, the city is not going to own this uh, Life files platform. Um, that's something we're looking at now of who could uh, who could help with the administration of that. Um, and obviously, as Carrie said, uh, everything's open source, everything's on the internet. You could start spinning up instances of this um, anywhere. So uh, when I also want to be clear, when we, when we talk about locations, we're not necessarily saying the government in that location should do this or you know the government in that in that place should do that. Um, um, nearly anyone or any service provider or any group uh, could could do this in any of those places. Yeah, ex excellent questions, both uh, Carl and uh, Aslan. And I'm actually really happy both of you here because one thing I would actually just like to, on behalf of uh, Carrie and Daniel, shout out here is that you know one thing Carrie is, and Daniel have expressed to me is that really to carry this project forward, one thing they really need now is to be networked with uh, hacktivists and civic-minded programmers who like to contribute their time to worthwhile open source projects. And this one is open source, it's on GitHub. So it, both of you tend to be pretty networked into communities who might have people who are interested in that. So certainly any people you know that you think might be interested in contributing their time to a good cause, I'm sure Carrie and Daniel would really appreciate it. Yeah, I actually brought this up at uh, my workplace because I work at a for a civic tech uh, focused agency uh, and that does federal stuff. And like one of our contracts is login.gov. And I'm not like on that project, but I have been pulled into a lot of stuff outside of my work actually for like authorization stuff for activist groups. But it's like, that's a, that's a difficult problem. And the government really is, they're trying to kind of fix it a little bit with login.gov. But uh, I mean, when I heard about this project, I heard about it in the context, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure maybe this isn't correct, but I had heard it in the context of like the work that had been done in Estonia with their EID. And, um, you know, I can, I can understand, you know, uh, what you're saying, Daniel, about uh, the Maybe the diff the difficulties. It's very difficult to bring this, these kinds of projects to government, especially in, in the current way that everything is procured. But I I am sort of interested in like uh, what the possibilities are with that stuff, especially and and maybe this is something y'all covered. But like this, I mean this this product, I mean this this thing, this program seems useful to me, even though I I'm not currently homeless right it seems like it's just like something that would be very useful to be able to have like you know that's like 50 percent of all civic tech is like programming crappy 1990s 
web form systems and trying to make them not crappy. So it's like, this just seems like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious about like, if there were like applications outside of homelessness that y'all had thought about or, or like how y'all had engaged with that. I don't know the answer is yes, but I will let them talk more about that. And just a second <laughs> that I'm thinking, well, yes, it would be nice if like, if, say I lost my wallet at the bar, I'm not seized in terror of having to go get all my documents again, basically. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if they were much more easy to recover than they currently are. Yeah, I mean, I, Daniel and I have thought a lot about a lot of the different use cases, you know, um, kids in foster care. Um, uh, I'm actually, uh, so the reason Daniel is acting chief innovation officer is I'm uh, on sabbatical right now. Um, and I'm traveling around in my motorhome to a bunch of different state national parks. And I myself would love a place to um, put my documents rather than carrying them around. Um, or putting them in a, a storage unit. So I think that there, there are a lot of use cases. Um, you know, I remember once, like when you first signed up for Airbnb, they were like, take your driver's license and, and you know, take a picture of it, right? Um, so there's, I, th I, th I think there's a lot of use cases for just holding onto your, your, your physical documents that are proof of something about you. What frustrated me is people are solving for digital identity, like, like logging in, but there's, you know, I have an identity around my immunizations, I have an identity around student loans, I have an identity around my, you know, um, uh, the classes, the coursework that I, that I took. Um, I have an identity around a mortgage that I have, like medical issues that I had. And when we did the Austin Blockchain Challenge with the Austin Blockchain Collective, there was a gentleman there who was an advocate for the autistic community. And he said, you know, he was like, you guys don't need a solution like this. This is dumb. What you need to do is design your systems right in the first place. And he's 100% correct. And it's never going to happen. <laughs> like, not anytime soon. Not why people are still, you know, just trying to access the services right here and now. Um, and he's like, I've seen parents break down and cry because they should have kept a document when their kid was diagnosed at age six. And now, you know, they're 16 and they need it and they don't have it. And so I just, I, I remember when my mom was in hospice, she needed a copy of her divorce decree for something. I can't even remember, but she was just like, what? Like nobody, need, nobody needs to put up with that stuff. Ch chances are you're going to be in a critical situation at some point in your life and you're going to need to reach back and pull a document that's dumb that nobody should be asking you for. Now you'll have it. I mean, you want to, you want to give in more like more both, you know, morbid and, and practical. We would sit down in workshops with our paramedics. And we were talking about complexity and complication and chaos. And I just think anytime a medic is around, it's gotta be chaos, right? But they're like, oh, no, 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 we've got standard operating procedures. We know what we're doing. Like it's it's all pretty controlled and maybe it may be chaotic for the patient, but it's not chaotic for us. And I was like, oh, has it ever been chaotic for you? And they go, yeah. There was a time when we were trying to uh, do CPR on a woman and her husband pulled a gun on us. And I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty chaotic. Um, and I'm pretty sure you guys don't get paid enough. Um, <laughs> and I was like, why, why did that happen? He goes, well, it turns out that um, she had a terminal illness. She had not resisted. All of the paramedics operate under medical license. And we have to have legal proof of that do not resuscitate order. And otherwise, we are not allowed to, to, to not give aid. So if that were your last wishes, if you had a living will that said do not resuscitate and you had something like this platform and, you know, the medic could access it, maybe there's an, a new feature, you know, five years from now that we've built out in this open source capacity that says, in case of emergency, we want you to know this about me. Like that, that could be another, another option. Um, I just, I find that people don't think about the adjacent possible, like there's so much futurism going on that we're not paying attention to the actual pieces of paper that we're still accumulating even in 2021 and asking people to show. 
next thing you'll tell me we still have to use fax machines. <laughs> it's in COVID tests. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I, I really appreciate those questions. Um, do we, uh, if Carl or Aslan, if you have any more, um, feel free. Oh, no, or, no. I just, if, yeah, uh, that sounds all, that is, a, it's definitely a steep climb. And um, I don't know uh, if Michael or David or Kathy have any questions or not, or I know, David, we've already talked about this project extensively, so we may have already exhausted all your questions on it a while ago, though I think you definitely raised many good ones as we worked on this. No, it's uh, no, as as you were, as I was listening, I was thinking, you know, I'm from New Orleans, and uh, I had, I don't know how long it took me to get my birth certificate. I, as people know by now, New Orleans is under sea level, and for some reason, the city had records that were in the basement. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, vital records. Uh, so for, for uh, months after that, that hurricane, uh, you know, we just had to wait until they dried things out. I don't even know what they did or how they recovered. Uh, but I'm thinking of, you know, what the climate change and flooding and fires and whatever yeah. else, you know, this is, yeah, we're going to need this technology even more. Yeah. And Agreed. I'm so surprised and they hadn't thought about it. Early. Well, and, and not only do we need this tech, but I really want it done in a way that like respects people's personal autonomy, because we know that the solution brought to you via Amazon will probably not be quite so user centered, you know, at least if it doesn't make money in some way. So I really want a socially responsible, thoughtful solution to this real major problem of modern life to gain traction. Um, and, and, you know, and I guess, um, you know, we are getting close to the end of our official time. Um, I probably will not keep us late both because I need to go. I suspect also after everything that happened and that there's so few of us anyway, probably not a good time for a post happy hour. So sorry to drag you in, Michael. We will resume that properly next time. Um, but I also just want to say that Carrie and Daniel that, uh, you know, definitely, I already was committed to trying to help you guys, but I owe you even more now that I'm going to do what I can to try to find you those programmers you desperately need to keep this afloat. I mean, I'd make it me, except I just already do a bazillion things and literally have to say no at some point. But I'm going to do what I can both to reach out to EFF to see who, what, who they recommend I reach out to. And I may also ask my employer, because much like Aslan's employer, my employer is very civic minded. They may know some people to connect you with. We really appreciate that. We'll be- Kevin, did you mention that. GitHub uh, earlier? Is this, is this like- It is literally, this is part of why I love the project. It's literally on GitHub. You can go and look at all the code search? and pull it right now. I actually yeah. did a Google search for live files GitHub and couldn't find it. So oh, yeah. we haven't renamed it yet. It's still my pass. I'll grab yeah. it. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. Yeah, yeah. Bef before we could hang up, if that link could get shared, that'd be great. Uh, and but, I will, I'll be yeah. adding issues. Um, no, I mean, the, the transparency on this project is staggering. Mm -hmm. And as it has to be for something involving such important documents, like it is a model everyone else needs to follow. Like normally everything's proprietary or hidden in internal code bases. You can't see anything. Here's literally everything. Magnificent. So here's, so here's a, here's a link, oh, there um, you, go. you know, on the screen, but you probably want them so that you can actually click on them. So Daniel can send <laughs> them to you. We can also make this presentation um, available uh, yeah. to everyone. Yes, um, um, as I understand it, and Tommy Ron Carey, this presentation is free for anyone to distribute. So if you, Aslan or Carl, wanted to share the presentation with people you know who you think might be interested in getting involved or volunteering, um, you, Carey or Daniel can provide you with it, as I understand it. Yep. And my pass. I'm calling it my pass because we were thinking about people accessing services, but then we got a trademark dispute email and we and so we decided to uh, just avoid all of that and rebrand it as life files. So that's the discrepancy there. And did you say which platforms you're starting with for your MVP? Is it are you Android and iPhone or it's, it's, uh, or? it's web yeah. web based it's a responsive web or web based? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. 
cool, cool. Uh, uh, when are you changing the name? What's that? When are you changing the name? It's technically um, changed. When, we're, we're just not. We just haven't changed the GitHub repository. Oh, OK. Just kind of slowly working backwards. Um, <laughs> you know. But yeah, the, the top, the first link I posted is to the, the main project, and then we have a separate um, or an additional repo for the multi level login work. So those are both there. And that's kind of how we're we're defensible against the the person who has a trademark dispute. It's like, oh, well, we were working on a project. We didn't have a we didn't have any platform. It was a project, so yeah. we called it the MyPass project. And now we're the project is over. Now we're moving into minimum viable product, which is Life Files. Okay, <laughs> sounds like a good strategy. All right, do we have uh, um, any final questions before we wrap up here? I'm oh, sorry, Carrie, didn't mean to cut you off. Just one one thing to note too is um, all of the UX components have been compiled as well. So any UX designer um, that if we build a new feature and we want to make it, you know, of the same UX, all of that stuff is has been made transparent by by our amazing UX designer. Um, we have Adam Wiedemann was our project lead. He's the one who wrote up. Um, the blockchain report and and helped discern the architecture. Neil Ressler was our um, I feel like this is the credits portion of the of the presentation. Neil <laughs> Ressler was our our blockchain developer. He was very very brilliant. Um, and Adam Carney is our, our dev. Um, and it has a very small contract with us to just keep it going. If it breaks, fix it. Um, but we've also given him a bucket of hours so that if anybody wants to get trained on how he's developed this platform, um, we can make that available um, as training or implementation. And Kevin, we'll also send uh, a set of links again to like that UX library to lots of other things so that it's all on the- Yes. The, and the, any and anyone who needs to get in touch with uh, Carrie and Daniel, you can get in touch with me and I can get you in touch with them. All that stuff's available through the repo, but we can also keep the direct links as well. All right. Any final questions? Nope. Oh, um, I'm curious. I, yeah, oh, I guess yeah, yeah, I, I am yeah, curious yeah. how. Uh, how you sustain yourselves while working on this, if, if like that is worked into your, into your budget with the, uh, with the grant, and um, yeah, I mean just with with endeavors like this that are open source, and you know I'm sure a lot of in kind time goes into it. Um, uh, I also am trying to build like social, civil liberties apps, but find it hard to. To do on in my spare time, like I'm when I'm when I'm also just trying to survive. So, yeah. yeah. So, Karen, Karen and I are both uh, in the city, and then we got this grant um, and and hired this team to work on it. So this has been one of the projects that we've been working on in our portfolio as part of our city work, and, and that that dev team who who is who came together and now is done. Um, was was hired for that grant. I, I don't so want to go ahead, Aslan. Oh, I, well, I was just I was going to kind of expand. I was going to ask a slightly different question. So, uh, go but for it. Uh, I mean, the, yeah. So, I mean, where I was going to ask was just like, uh, uh, do you all like? I mean, uh, the the German government has like a program with Nextcloud where they basically partially fund Nextcloud, and the Nextcloud open source company also produces an open source platform that powers the German government. For a bunch of stuff so i'm kind of curious like there's not really much of that in america for some reason because but, but, i mean we have a lot of contracting companies so it seems to me like it would make sense to like so i'm kind of curious like i mean is that is that a possibility of like there, that's one reason i was asking about like expansion and stuff is like is this is this if you solve a problem in one place it's nice when you can solve it a lot of places and open source scales right that's right yeah, so I, I think open source for the company? city of Austin, yeah, well, for the city of Austin right now, um, I think the city of Austin is putting its oxygen mask on its own face and, and not mm -hmm. spinning out startups necessarily. Um, you know, we've got a, 
really track our budget carefully coming out of COVID um, mm -hmm. and coming out of the Texas ledge and the tax rate caps and whatnot. So I think that what our hope is, is the innovation office is that if we package this up in open source and everything is transparent, and that was actually a condition of the grant in any case, then the, the future is to be written. And that's part of where governance becomes the next step. Should it be a nonprofit that at least manages the, the, the technical um, you know, standards for this platform so that anything that is, maybe it's Life Files Austin, maybe it's Life Files New Orleans, maybe it's Life Files Seattle, or, or go to the state level, it's Life Files Texas or Life Files Louisiana, um, that it's, it's always maintaining those, those design principles and the same you know, technical standards. Um, and, you know, would a, would a nonprofit that would be a technical steward of this platform then pursue in its roadmap the, um, the NIST certification, you know, I, I think that's where the next conversation has to go is, is this platform worth continuing those conversations with engaged and committed stakeholders but to exist because of how we built it, you know, to be secure by design, be permanent. Those are some key differentiators. And, and, and I guess, you know, and, sorry, I was of the, of the population. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I was just butting in here to say that, unfortunately, I do have to run and the Zoom meeting dies with me. So I do think I am going to need to make that be the uh, last question. So I want to uh, thank all of you who stuck with us here. Uh, your support <laughs> means a lot. And we were, and I see we lost Carrie there. Oh, yeah, Carrie, Carrie um, I was just saying, we're going to actually have to wrap this up. I have to go. So that's going to have to be the last question. Um, so thank you all so much. I'm so happy we managed to get through this. I was so upset I was about ready to throw in the towel, but I was like, no, the I we need to get this out there to people. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, we will be making changes and learning from this so that this does not happen going forward. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. And I in, and definitely anybody who can, is interested in this project and believes in it, let's stay in touch. If any of you uh, need to know how to email somebody, uh, get at me and I'll connect you with the right person. But as always, we appreciate your support and it's really cool to see cool people working on cool things. So thank you both so much. Thank you all for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.